My name is Ali Toomey. I am the Education Coordinator for Earth Echo International. Um, a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, this is really interactive. We want you all to be able to ask questions. So we do have two ways that you can ask questions. If you are watching on our website, so if you got that link in the Earth Echo email, on the website you should see a question forum underneath the viewing window where you're actually watching the Hangout. Um, you can just submit your question right there. You don't have to give us your email address, but if we don't get to your question, that's a great way for us to contact you afterwards. Um, and if you're watching on Google+, you should see a Q&A app in your viewing window. Right there, you can actually just submit your questions um, right there through the Q&A app. And if you see somebody that has a similar question as you, go ahead and give that question a plus one um, to say that you agree with it. And the more plus ones we get, the more likely we'll answer those questions. We'll try to get to those first. Um, let's everyone sort of try out the question app right now. If I could just have everyone um, leave a comment with where they're tuning in from. We'd love to see where people are coming from. I know we have quite a few schools from Miami tuning in today, so we are excited to have all of you. And I know we have some from LA and Virginia and Maryland and DC as well. So welcome to all of you. Um, before we get started, I just want to give you a little bit of background on Earth Echo Expeditions. Earth Echo Expeditions is a project that we started this year, um, and we went on a journey to explore a worldwide ocean issue. This year we chose dead zones. So on our website, there's tons of resources, videos, lesson plans um, for teachers and for students to use to explore that issue of dead zones. And to help us sort of explore our underwater areas a little bit more, um, we are at Florida International University today at their School of the Environment, Arts, and Society. And we have Dr. Mike Heithouse with us. Um, he is a professor of biology who studies marine ecosystems, especially the role of large predators in those ecosystems such as sharks. So he's got a lot of great things for us today. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him and be sure to um, write in with your questions. Thank you, Mike. Well, thank you very much and thanks everybody for being here to uh, spend some time with us down here in a uh, beautiful day in Miami. Um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you today about some of the animals and uh, issues that I love to study and try to work on. Um, here at FIU, we're really interested in trying to find a way to balance human needs uh, of the ocean with having awesome, healthy ecosystems. And I've spent the last 20 years getting to work all over the world from Australia and the Pacific Ocean, uh, up near the Arctic Ocean, and then across the U.S on big marine predators like sharks, dolphins, whales. Um, and as you travel around the world, you see that um, the oceans, even though they're really important for people, you know, in some spots they may produce 90% or more of the food that people need to eat, that the oceans are in trouble. And that can be for lots of different reasons. You guys are probably studying dead zones right now. And we'll talk a bit about that later. But we also have issues of coastal ecosystems kind of being destroyed, mangrove forests and marshes being ripped out. Um, and in a lot of places, the fisheries or the fish we catch, we're actually catching too many and populations are declining. So for example, the sharks I study, their populations may have declined 90% or more in some areas. And so what I want to find out, my students want to find out is, what does that mean for the oceans? And how do we get the oceans back to as healthy as they used to be while we're still able to uh, use them for food for people because you know, we, we rely on the ocean so much. But before we talk a bit about dead zones, I thought that I'd share a few things with you that are really fun. The first of which is to talk about the marine mammals, which are some of my favorites, because we've got some skulls here that you probably haven't seen before that are tell, will tell us a lot about how these animals live their lives. And then at the end, I'm going to tell you about some cool ways that we study ocean ecosystems. So we'll start out here, and um, it doesn't look like anyone's here that can yell answers out to me, so I'm going to have to uh, give you a few seconds to think about these things in your classes, and maybe you guys can shout out what you think the answers are and then test yourselves. So let's start out right here, and uh, this is probably one of the best-known marine mammals, 
which are animals that are related to cats and dogs and us. They have hair, they give birth to live young, and they, uh, they breathe air, but they're adapted to the ocean environments. And anyone have an idea what this skull might be from? Anyone yelling dolphin? I hope so, because that's what this is. This is the uh, bottlenose dolphin that most of us have uh, heard about or we see in uh, aquariums or on TV. Um, and they have, you can see lots of special teeth here. These uh, dolphins are really built for uh, going out and catching slippery prey like fish and squids. Now, the bottlenose dolphins we find in coastal environments right here out the window at FIU. I can actually see them sometimes. But they'll also live really far out in the middle of the oceans. And, you know, this is one animal that you might not think would be really affected by things like dead zones because they breathe air. So in these dead zones, usually we have the oxygen being sucked out of the water. And so fish wouldn't have enough air to breathe. But what are the dolphins eating? They're eating things like those fish. And if there's no oxygen for the fish, the fish leave. And that means the dolphins have to leave too. So this shows that things that are happening at the bottom of food webs will affect the entire food web all the way up to the top, including a lot of the animals that we really like to go out and see. Now, even though this is kind of your, your standard dolphin um, or tooth whale skull, there's all kinds of different shapes and sizes. And uh, here's another one. This is actually from a porpoise. Now, some of you may have heard that dolphins and porpoises are the same thing. Well, they're actually not. There are a lot more species of dolphins than porpoises. The porpoises are smaller than dolphins usually. And instead of having those little peg-like teeth that we saw in the dolphin, I'm going to see if I can get this really close. There we go. The shape of these teeth is a little different. They look like little shovels. And that's one of the ways that we can tell that we have a porpoise uh, instead of a dolphin. Now, some of the porpoises are some of the most endangered marine mammals in the world. Uh, the vaquita, which is a small porpoise, the skull would be about this size, uh, maybe a little smaller, lives in the Gulf of California. And they've been caught in fishing nets um, called gill nets, and their populations are down to uh, just maybe a couple hundred individuals. And so people and marine biologists are trying to find out how we can protect the, uh, the last of these vaquita. Now we've got two more of these kind of dolphin skulls, and I'm running through this really fast because we don't have nearly enough time together today. Um, is this not one of the weirdest skulls you have ever seen? So if the animal's head was here, it would kind of look like that. My hand would be the forehead. But why does it have these weird kind of pieces of the skull that stick out that we don't see in uh, the other skulls? There's nothing there. And for uh, dolphins, a lot of them live in areas where the water's not very clear, so they can't rely on their eyesight to find prey, so they use sound, a lot like bats do. So there's a, uh, kind of inside their uh, blowhole, there are these little things called the monkey lips. And those monkey lips click together really fast, and it sends out a really fast click. And those clicks go out into the environment, they hit a fish, and then they bounce back, and they come through the lower jaw into the inner ear, and the dolphins can see with sound. And so it can be completely dark or murky water, and the dolphins can find their prey. And this is a, a species of river dolphin, and they live in really, really muddy rivers. So a lot of the river dolphins don't even have eyes that they don't even work if the water was clear. So they have these special parts of the skull to focus that sound beam out, and then it bounces off and comes back. So they have really good ability to use sound to see a, the environment around them and to catch fish. The other thing you can see about this cool dolphin is that it has a really long snout, and that's really good for slashing back and forth and uh, catching fish that are swimming away really quickly. Okay, so let's move on to some other cool, oh wait, wait, one more kind of relative of the dolphins, and this one's big. This one is from a big animal called a beaked whale, and I've kind of pulled it apart. Now, do you notice anything really weird about this beaked whale skull besides it's really big? So these animals may be you know, 20 feet long or more. Well, have a look at that jaw. Do you see any teeth in it? That's not because the teeth fell out. It's because they basically only have one. Sorry, I disappeared. I'm coming back. 
So they basically have lost all their teeth because they eat slippery squid, but they can open their lower jaw and create a suction of water, and they can slurp the squid straight in. They don't need to chew it or grab it with teeth. And so they don't need any teeth, but they do have these kind of two weird teeth on the lower jaw. And in some of the uh, beaked whales, those teeth are so big and they curl around that the beaked whales can only open their mouth a tiny little bit. And why would you have those? Well, some people think it's so they can fight with other beaked whales uh, over mates, and some is it's kind of like showing off. This is beaked whale bling. They uh, impress other beaked whales by having these really cool big teeth. Okay, so next thing to look at, let's play another guessing game. Anyone want to guess what this might be? That's a hard one. This is actually a sea cow, but it's not the sea cows we have in Florida, the manatees. This is Australia's version of a manatee called a dugong. And so these are big animals. And here's the cool thing. After we're done talking, you guys can go on as a class and go investigate all these animals we're talking about, find pictures and videos of them, and see how they live their lives. So hopefully what we're talking about today will get you excited about learning a lot more about the oceans. So this is a sea cow. You can see down here in the snout, it doesn't have any teeth down there, and that's because they've got big, fleshy lips that they can use to grab onto the seagrass and pull it up into their mouth. So these are pretty much vegetarians that eat seagrass, um, and they like to dig down into the bottom to pull up the nutritious stems of the seagrass, and then they can grind them up on these teeth uh, that are in the back of the mouth. Now, have a close look at this. What animal on land do you think might be the most closely related to a sea cow? The answer is not a cow. How about an elephant? See those tusks? Those are uh, kind of give us hints that these guys are related to elephants. And in fact, when we see dugongs out in the wild in Australia, a lot of them will have scrapes and scratches on their backs, and it's from uh, the tusks from from the, uh, the sea cow. Okay, let's do maybe one more marine mammal here. This one might be a little easier to figure out. This is from a seal, and this is actually from a leopard seal. So uh, I don't know what age class is we hear. You guys watch Happy Feet 2, the leopard seals in that chasing the penguins around. That's this guy. And these are one of the, uh, the biggest uh, seals. And unlike a lot of seals, yeah, they tend to dive deep. They like to eat squid. Leopard seals are big time predators. They love to eat penguins. They'll eat other seals. But the weird thing is, even though they eat those big things, they also eat very small animals too. They eat krill, which is kind of a weird diet. Small krill and big seals. And you can see they're built for that. They've got these big teeth and this big, strong skull for eating uh, penguins. But then if you get really close here, look at those teeth. When they close those teeth, they kind of form a neck. And so what they can do is swim through the water and kind of get a big gulp of a bunch of krill. And then they can kind of push the water out through those uh, teeth. And they keep the, uh, the krill, which are a shrimp-like creature, inside. Water goes out, and then they can uh, suck them down. Now, let's think about the, uh, the closest land a animal uh, relative of these guys. Maybe something like a bear? Well, it's probably right. So these are very kind of from the bears. The one I didn't show you that's kind of weird is uh, some of the closest land ancestors of the uh, dolphins. How about a sheep? Now, they didn't, sheep, they didn't come from sheep many uh, millions of years ago, but from an ancestor that also uh, kind of evolved into sheep. Um, one last one here, and then we'll move on to some other cool stuff, and I'm going to see if I can move this around. I'm going to just pick it up. Okay. What's this one? This one is a walrus. And... Um, They've got these huge tusks, but a lot of times those tusks are just used as ice picks. So they can push them into the ice and use them to pull their body up onto the ice. 
most of the time, walruses are eating clams, and uh, they're really good at eating clams. They can actually suck the clams right out of their shell, and sometimes in just one dive to the bottom, they can eat six or 12 clams all in one go. So uh, they are, are pretty impressive animals. And you know, one problem for the marine mammals um, is that they are at the top of the food chain. And because they're at the top of the food chain, a lot of their populations are in trouble, uh, mostly because uh, there are changes in their prey, so there's not enough food for them. In the case of walruses and polar bears, changes in the sea ice uh, can cause trouble for them. And in some places, marine mammals, because they eat some of the uh, fish that people want, that can cause problems for the marine mammals too. Those big dead zones we talked about, especially in the tropical waters, can be a real problem for the dolphins because they lose big swaths of their habitat. But it's really important that we learn more about not just marine mammals, but other ocean predators because it's not just about how the bottom affects the top of the food web. These predators could be really, really important in affecting the entire ecosystem below them. So uh, we talked about marine mammals. They're one predator. Can you guys think of some other big ocean predators that we might want to know something about? Anyone say sharks? I hope someone said sharks because the sharks are uh, one of my favorites. And I've spent the last 20 years working on shark populations and trying to understand how important they are uh, in the ecosystem. Now, most sharks, and there are over 500 different types of them, actually aren't that huge. A lot of the sharks are maybe only you know, four, five, even six feet long, which isn't too big. There are only a, a small, smaller number of species that get to be really big. And so those really big sharks, like the tiger sharks, the white sharks, and bull sharks, are ones that we're especially worried about and want to know more about because they might have such a big effect on their entire ecosystem. And so that's one of the things that I've been working on, um, especially in Australia, for about the last uh, 15 years. Now we're going to go to uh, some slides here to show you that I'll, I'll tell you a bit more about how we study these big ocean predators. Before we get to the slides, Mike, um, we have one question that came in specifically about the skulls. So if we oh, could cool. take a moment to answer that. We have a lot of great questions coming in. Um, but this one says, you just taught me that dolphins have really sharp teeth. What do they usually eat, and how long do they live in the wild as compared to captivity? So I think that piggybacks nicely off what you were talking about. Okay, that is a great, great question. And uh, I'll bring the the teeth up again. So yeah, you can see these sharp teeth, but they're not meant for cutting. They're really meant for grabbing and holding on to slippery prey. So they like to eat uh, smaller fish and squid. And now in Australia where I work on dolphins, sometimes a dolphin gets really ambition, it, ambitious and it catches a huge fish, but it can't take bites out of it. So they have to take it down to the bottom and drag it along the bottom until the head falls off. If it's still too big for them to swallow, they keep dragging it along the bottom until smaller chunks fall off. So the dolphins are really limited in the size of prey that they can eat. That's different than some of the sharks, which can take big bites out of things and can kind of cut their prey up. But even so, most sharks only eat prey that's about 10% you know, of their own size or less. So even though we think about sharks eating big things, there are only a few species like whites, tigers, and bulls, and maybe six gill sharks that eat really big prey. Now the question about how long do these animals live in captivity versus the wild, it's a really good question and it's a hard one for us to answer because we haven't been able to follow individual dolphins in the wild um, in a lot of places. There's a spot here in Florida in Sarasota Bay um, up near Tampa and then in Australia in Shark Bay where I've done a lot of work where people have studied the dolphins for uh, 20, 30, well actually more like 30, 40 or even 50 years. And it looks like some of those dolphins, may, these bottlenose dolphins, may be able to live 40 or 50 years, but probably getting into their 20s is not too bad. And probably, especially for males, that's about how they long, long they live is into their 20s. And you have to remember, the wild's not the easiest place. Even though we've heard stories about dolphins kind of ramming and killing sharks, turns out that's more fiction than fact. And usually dolphins that see sharks swim the other way really fast. And in fact, sharks can be a really major threat to dolphins. So uh, sharks like tiger sharks can, can eat dolphins. So probably a lot of the dolphins in captivity are living similar lifespans um, to the ones in the wild. 
Um, and we don't really, we haven't had the dolphins in captivity so long with kind of the modern veterinary medicine that we've even know kind of how long they can possibly live. So that's a question that a lot of scientists are still trying to figure out. But absolutely great question. And you know, this is one of the things about science that I love the most is that there's still questions we don't know the answer to. And it's the process of going out and learning about these things. And hopefully some of you guys watching are going to be the ones to answer some of these questions that you stumped me on that we don't even know about yet. Great. Thanks, Mike. We can move on to your slides now. I'll pull those up. Okay, cool. So back many years ago when I was in college and I was in school, I was a swimmer. And I thought I was pretty good in the water. And uh, once I started studying ocean animals, I realized I am not really a very good swimmer. And uh, in fact, if Michael Phelps were to go into the oceans and hang out with these ocean animals, unfortunately, our Olympic champions would probably feel the same. And so we've got all these animals we need to learn a lot more about, but we're really limited in these ecosystems. I mean, imagine trying to keep up with a sperm whale, and I don't have the skull of that because they're so huge, they can dive a mile underwater. The beaked whale I showed you the skull of, some of the latest information says they may be able to hold their breath for two hours and dive more than a mile underwater. So how do we study these animals? And you know, sometimes I hear science is boring because you don't have to be creative. And uh, we can go to the next slide. This is where I love to tell people that science, you have to be good in science, you have to be super creative. Um, and a lot of times that takes the form of having to learn about new technologies. Um, and so I'm trying to see if that slides up here yet or if you're staring at me dancing around still. Okay, there we go. Um, and the, one of the first techniques people used to study these animals that can swim across entire oceans was what you see in the lower left on this great hammerhead. That little white bar is an acoustic tracking device and basically we can follow along behind it and hear little pings on the map. But eventually something happens. We either run out of gas on the boat, we run out of coffee and we can't stay awake, or the weather gets really, really bad and we have to come back in. So we may only see what an animal's done over a day or if we're really lucky, two days. Now, we also don't know how they go up and down in the water. And both sharks and marine mammals move around in three dimensions a lot. So you can see in the upper left there, a guy has that little black thing that's on the yellow uh, foam. That's called a time depth recorder. And that time depth recorder is a little computer that we can put on the animals. It comes off after two days, we get it back, and it tells us how deep the animals have been swimming and for how long. But we still only get a couple days of a window into their lives. And so the next technology was to use space to study the oceans. So we have these little tags that we can put on them. Um, you see on the right side, that's going on a tiger shark there in Australia. Every time that tiger shark comes up to the surface, that tag sends in a little ping back to us, and we get an email that tells us where it is. That tiger shark you see there swam from Australia to South Africa in three months, all the way across an ocean. And that shows how important it is that all the countries work together to protect sharks because they're swimming across the whole ocean. Next slide. Now, the one thing that we don't have uh, using these techniques is eyes in the water. Wouldn't it be awesome not just to see where these animals go, but to see what they're doing in different places? And there's a whole set of instruments now uh, that we call animal-born video systems that are kind of scientific research tools. They have the time depth recorder, the trackers, the GPS, all that stuff. And a video camera in one package that we put on the animal, we get to see where they go, and we get to kind of see what they see and do what they do from their perspective and then get all that information about the oceans around them. So the pictures you see here are of a green turtle um, in Australia, and uh, you can see the back of its head there. Um, in the top corner, that video's uh, not working right now. Otherwise, you would see that turtles greet each other the same way two dogs do in the park. They go have a nice sniff of each other's backside. And I can tell you, sea turtle biologists had no idea this is how turtles greeted each other until we put video cameras on them. Now. The first step, next slide, to uh, doing this work is that we actually have to put the cameras on the animals. Uh, my favorite way to do this is with a suction cup, um, which if you just happen to have caught a sea turtle like you see here, um, you just put it on its shell. Um, if it's a smooth shell, the pilot whale you see in the other picture, there's a long pole that we have the camera on and we gently lower it onto the uh, animal and the air gets sucked out. Next slide. 
For some animals, they've got really uh, rough skin, like sharks. Their scales look like little teeth. They're very rough, so you can't get a suction on them. Um, but luckily, they have a dorsal fin that we can just kind of strap the camera to with a, a material that holds onto those scales. Then when the computer tells the camera it's time to fall off, the kind of clamp opens up and everything floats to the surface and there's nothing left on the shark. Uh, next slide. For seals, animals with hair, mammals, so um, the next one, the gray seal you see there is not too different in size from the uh, skull we saw from the leopard seal. And then loggerhead turtles that you see on the right there, they have very rough shells. So we use special glues that quickly dissolve in seawater so that once the cameras come off, again, there's nothing left um, on the animals. Now, the thing with uh, these systems that you're seeing those pictures of, those were probably taken back before most of you were born when we had to record video on something called a video tape. And now with technological advances, and we can go to the live feed again here, we've made these cameras much, much smaller. So this is the size of a camera we used to have back in the 1990s when I took those pictures. This is actually smaller than the ones you saw, and it's much smaller around. And those cameras only got six hours of video. Now we've been able to shrink them to that size. And actually, this is one of our biggest camera units that lasts the longest. We have some that are about the size of a cell phone that'll collect 120 hours of video now. So we're able to put these uh, camera systems on a, uh, an animal. So here we have a turtle shell from a turtle that lived a very nice long life. Um, and we just put the camera on it. You can see the camera just sits on that shell and records the daily life of that turtle until we tell the camera it's time to come off. And it could be a day, it could be a couple days, it could be a week. And then the camera comes up, floats to the surface, and then with, oops, I'll put it down here, with this antenna, that sends out a signal, and we can track that camera down from, oh, 20 miles away. And uh, we need to go get that camera back, because if we don't get it back, we just have a really angry engineer who used camera you just lost, and you don't get any of the video. Um, so what we'll do now, and I, the audio is going to cut out when we do this, we'll show you a quick video of what this looks like, and you are about to see the high energy turtle fight. So we'll watch this for about 20 seconds, then I'll come back and answer all your, well, as many questions as they can before they cut me off. Okay, let's roll the video. And while we're waiting, if you can still hear me, you can go online and find even more of these videos on the, uh, the turtle cameras. Can you guys hear me? I think we're still standing by here. So just to entertain you while we're waiting for the video to come out, see that gray seal on the left? I got sent out there by National Geographic to a small island called Sable Island. It's uh, about 200 miles offshore of uh, Nova Scotia, Canada, in the middle of the North Atlantic in January. I guess they like to take the Florida guys and send them to the coldest weather possible. But one of the most amazing places I've ever seen because it's this 40 kilometer long island and there are 100,000 gray seals out there. Huge population of gray seals. Um, and we were putting those cameras on the gray seals to try to figure out what they're eating. Because there's another type of seal, the harbor seal, whose populations are disappearing on that island. So we wanted to see if it was competition between the gray seals and harbor seals that was leading to the harbor seal decline. It actually turns out it wasn't the prey at all. It's actually the sharks. The uh, small gray seal pups are about the size of an adult harbor seal, and the increasing gray seal population has attracted more sharks, which has caused trouble for the harbor seals. Now, luckily, that island is kind of marginal space for the harbor seals. There are plenty of them back on shore where they normally are breeding. Hey, Mike. The um, video does not seem to be playing for some reason, um, or it's playing, but it's not showing to everyone. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead, and that will be up on the Earth Echo website after this webcast so that everyone can watch it. Um, but can you just say the YouTube account where these are held again so that other people can go and find them? Okay. Uh, if you Google, uh, what, Turtle Video Height House, which is H-E-I-T-H-A-U-S, 
uh, you'll find those videos, or you can find them on our lab blog, which is Height House Lab, so H-E-I-T-H-A-U-S Lab dot blogspot dot com. We got a lot of science adventures there from all over the world, middle of the Pacific, Australia, and we have these videos on there. So uh, love to see people join along in the adventure there. The other place if you want to see our work on Australia, uh, the website is sberp dot org, and uh, that'll give you plenty of time to look at stuff. So uh, shall we go to questions then? Yeah, was there anything else you wanted to share before we head into questions, or have you kind of covered everything? Well, I think I've covered uh, pretty much everything. I guess the last thing that I'd say, uh, in case we get cut off during the questions, is that um, there's all kinds of really cool stuff out there, and you guys can start being scientists right now. You know, that's the neat thing about science, is you don't have to wait until you're finished with college or something like that. By going out, asking questions, and exploring, you can be a scientist now. I grew up in the middle of the cornfields in Ohio and got to eventually be a marine biologist just because I was so excited about exploring the world around me. So I hope everyone after this will go out, be curious, go explore your own backyard, and uh, never stop uh, having fun exploring and asking questions. Yeah, and I think that's actually a really great segue. Um, Someone had asked, what are some things that we can do, and they're in Pennsylvania, so here in Pennsylvania, to help protect our oceans, but really that applies to anyone not living by the water. What exactly can they do to help protect the oceans? Well, th that's a great question, and there are lots of things we can do, even when I was growing up in Ohio. Um, one thing you'll know when you start studying uh, these dead zones is that a lot of the problems in those dead zones actually start thousands or hundreds of miles from the ocean. And so we want to make sure that we're not putting too much fertilizer on our lawns or our parents aren't putting too much fertilizer on our lawn, that we're not putting any pollutants into the waters because anything that runs into the rivers goes downstream and eventually is going to end up in the oceans. Um, just simple things we can do around the house to conserve energy um, or reduce our waste by recycling, that ultimately helps the oceans because you know, if we create, you know, use too much energy, we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, that creates more acidic conditions in the oceans, which can have problems for the base of the food webs that the sharks and marine mammals rely on. So anything that you can do to kind of protect your local environment is ultimately going to help the oceans. It's also really important that you kind of know what you're eating or you tell your parents to figure out um, what kind of fish they're getting, because there's some fish that are, are harvested in a way that's really fine for the oceans. So if you go online and look at something called Seafood Watch, you can figure out what fish are the best to eat to make sure we have healthy oceans and also that are better for you because some of the fish have lots of toxins in them and you want to avoid those in, when you're eating. So those are just some simple things and also just spreading the message about how awesome and important the oceans are. I was on mute. Great, thank you. Um, and kind of to piggyback off of that, um, we had another question that came in from John F. Kennedy Middle, Middle School and they want to know can you explain what a dead zone is, just so everyone is clear? We've been talking a lot about dead zones, and some people have seen our videos, some haven't. So if you just want to give a brief description of a dead zone. Okay, so again, the simple explanation of, of dead zones like we have here in the Gulf of Mexico, what happens is we put lots of nutrients, so we put fertilizers um, or you know, wastewater. It has lots of things that plankton like to eat. And what happens is we put too much of this into the water, and then we end up having lots of these little uh, microscopic organisms uh, start to uh, reproduce, then they die, and when they die and things are consuming too much oxygen, it basically sucks the oxygen out of the water. And if there's no oxygen in the water, then there's not enough there for the invertebrates and the fish and the base of the food web. And so it means that as you go up, you have these big areas where you have really not many animals uh, or organisms living. Uh, because we kind of over-enriched the waters, and then things died and it sucked all the, uh, the oxygen out. Perfect description. One question that is a little off topic, but I can answer. Is this webinar being recorded? It is being recorded. You can all watch it later on. Um, it will be on the Earth Echo website, so you can watch it many, many times um, and see all of the great skulls and the pictures and everything that Dr. Heithouse has shown. So that will be available for everyone. Um, we also got a question about 
you know, what can students do with their classes to improve their local watershed? Um, Chantilly High School, they have a class that has already done some water testing, but they want to know what else they can do to take that next step. Well, that's another really good one. Uh, a few things that I can think of off the top. I mean, just even doing uh, river cleanups, um, you'd be surprised how much stuff gets dumped in there. Uh, make sure you have proper protective gear, but uh, doing river cleanups is good. Finding places where you can uh, try to replant uh, native plants along the edges of these rivers can be very good as well because these wetland plants, marshes, help to pull some of the pollutants out of the water. So, you know, maybe finding a, a portion of the river where you could restore a wetland or replant some of that. Uh, the other thing would be to help with education because in some places you've got farmland or other things where people just don't know that waste products or uh, pollution might harm the waters. So working with uh, local groups to uh, find ways to reduce things flowing into the rivers, you know, and again, creating those kind of buffers and new wetlands really can do a whole lot of good for local environments. And the cool thing is it helps everybody downstream too. Very true. Um, and so now I think I've kind of covered all the water quality questions that we have. We have a lot of questions coming in about your skulls and the animals that you work with. So we'll start with... Um, we have a question from Griffin Elementary School. They want to know how many species of sea turtle are out there. How many different species are there? Oh, it depends who you ask because some people are trying to split them. They're about seven. So we've got uh, green turtles, loggerhead turtles, leatherbacks, uh, flatbacks, olive ridleys, Kemp's ridleys, hawksbills. Uh, and then the question is whether they're black turtles are really green turtles or a different species. So that will give you seven or eight uh, species right there. Very cool. Um, we also have someone, and I thought this was really interesting too, who wants to know how the sheep and dolphin are related. Do you know what their common ancestor is? That's coming from Howard Drive Elementary School. Oh, another awesome one. And one of the reasons I love this question is I teach a class to university students on marine mammals, and the answer has kind of changed every time because we're learning new things and getting more of an idea of what they look like, what that ancestor looked like. And our best guess now is that there was an animal that looked a bit like what's called a mouse deer. So you can Google a mouse deer. It's a small, you know, little, looks like kind of an antelope or a deer that's about that big. And the idea was that this animal, so it doesn't look anything like a sheep, probably started out by uh, when predators were around running away into the, into the water and got really good at swimming to get away from big predators that would eat it. Um, and gradually started being able to take advantage of the food and being a better swimmer. And you know, these animals were probably around you know, 60 million years ago, so very, very long ago. And then they slowly adapted uh, to being the, uh, the marine mammals that led to the whales and dolphins. And there are kind of two major groups that are still around from that common ancestor in the oceans. Uh, we have the, uh, the baleen whales, so the ones that don't have teeth but have big baleen like humpback whales and blue whales. And then you have the toothed whales, which include the killer whales, the dolphins, um, the porpoises, the beaked whales, most pretty much the ones uh, that I showed you. And right now we're trying to figure out where hippos fit into that because it turns out hippos may also be a very close relative to that group. And to learn more about it, we look at the genes of these animals. So as we get better at looking at DNA and genetics, that helps us learn the relationships of the animals that are still alive. But then it's up to paleontologists uh, all over the world digging up new fossils with things that tell us, you know, who's related to, to who out there. And, and they're uncovering new places uh, further back in time on the uh, kind of whale family tree. So there's always neat new discoveries coming out. Great. And we have a class from New Orleans tuning in, and they want to know what damage did the oil spill do um, in the Gulf of Mexico to the turtles and some of the other animals that you study, and how are those effects um, still happening today? Well, that's, that's a really good question, um, and a lot of people have been looking at that, and in fact, there are a group of scientists I work with. We're studying the shark effects on sharks, um, and on uh, hopefully the, we'll start more work on dolphins. Uh, right after the spill, a lot of sea turtles, I don't know the exact number, were actually killed by the spill because they have to come to the surface and so they had to go through that and got swamped with uh, the oil and, and died. Same thing with the marine mammals. Uh, there are now indications that there may be long-term health problems uh, that are occurring. You know, those animals would have been breathing the, uh, the toxins um, from the oil and the surface waters. 
Um, there are a couple places around the country where we have um, larger die-offs and strandings of dolphins than normal, and one of them is in the, the Gulf of Mexico. That's probably linked to the oil spill, but scientists are still trying to figure that out. Um, and there's still oil out there, and that's the thing that people don't know, is that we've cleaned up a lot of what hit the beaches, but when we put dispersants on that oil, what that does is makes it sink. It doesn't magically disappear. And so there's a lot of oil that's still probably in the deep sea or sludges of oil because the little uh, microbes that kind of chew up the oil naturally haven't had enough time to get rid of it. And so um, we're still trying to figure out what the effects are on the ecosystem, but they probably are still ongoing. Great. Thank you. And we are running out of time for questions. We have lots of great questions that are coming in, and we just don't have time to answer them all. Um, but Dr. Heithouse and I will work together later to answer a couple of the questions and get those up on our website so that no questions are left unanswered. Um, we did have one question coming in from local Miami schools that were wondering um, if you guys come out and bring your skulls to schools. Is that something, a program that you guys offer? We haven't done it yet, but uh, it's something we can do. So uh, get in touch with us here at the School of Environment, Arts, and Society at FIU, and uh, we'll we'll figure something out. Great, and we can connect you. We can connect teachers to you as well. So before we head out, um, I just want to let teachers and students know of a couple great resources on our website. Um, you can visit our educator resources page. Um, our educator resources page houses all of our action guides, which are really great plans where students and classrooms can help take action. So Dr. Heithouse mentioned how things like a beach cleanup um, and being aware of the chemicals that you're putting down your drain, how those all affect our watersheds and ecosystems, and action guides to take action around those issues can all be found on our educator resources page. So that's a really great place to go. As well as our videos on dead zones, um, those are all can be found on our website as well. So www.earthecho.org is the best place to go for all of that information. Um, we also wanted to let teachers know that we do have a funding grant available. Um, this is through the NEA Foundation. The deadline is June 1st. Um, it's a great way to get funding in for future projects um, that can help protect your watershed. So any of the things that you learned about today and that you can apply some of our materials and curriculum to to help clean up your local waterways and protect all of those animals. Um, last but not least, you can always reach out to us. Um, you can email me at education at earthecho.org. I'm more than happy to talk with teachers and students um, and help you guys get started on some really great projects to help protect our waterways. So I just want to say again, one really big thank you to um, Florida International University and Dr. Mike Heithouse for coming in and seeing all of us today. Thank you very much for tuning in. Thanks. Bye. Get out here and explore, guys. <laughs>